station for today, you might have seen this before, is deep whole body control, learning a unified policy for manipulation and locomotion, and Deepak will be presenting it. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the last talk of the day. So, Zipeng and Shuchen could not make it to New Zealand uh, because of their visa issues. So, here I am presenting their work on whole body control. So, before I start, let me ask you a question. Apart from uh, dirty laundry list, what is the next most common thing you have seen at Coral this year? You can think about it. But for me, wherever I go, I see legged robots. <laughs> they are there on the stairs. They are there where the food is. They are there. They are sitting here. And they are there in every talk, almost uh, 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 every next talk. So a lot of progress has been made in legged robots. And they can walk outside. They can walk in forests. They can walk in, in water. So the question is, what's next? What is, uh, how do I use this robot to do anything uh, more useful? So just locomotion is restrictive. It's restrictive in the sense that they can walk around, do inspection, but I cannot do any manipulation with that. So the next step here is to add an arm. Like have a robot with an arm on top and legs increase your reach, arm helps me manipulate in the real world. Good, okay. So where do I get this robot? So we went online, tried to look up the existing models and turned out the price tag is so expensive we cannot afford these uh, uh, robots, especially in academia, or can afford only one in our career. So, <laughs> so here is a like, spot from Boston Dynamics with ARM, cost over 100K. Other one is from ETH, uh, from Animal Robot, uh, not on sale, it's not commercial yet. Okay, so what we did, we said, okay, let's buy the cheapest legged robot out there, the cheapest ARM out there, and put them together in a custom setup. So here is our low cost legged manipulator. Uh, and you can see the details here. It costs 6K, uh, which is two order of magnitude less than the comparison competitive robots. Now, the interesting part is with this platform, here comes a new challenge. You have to now control both legs and arm together. So this problem in literature is called whole body control. Now, this is an area where lots of, uh, lots of work has been done in the control literature for the last uh, uh, 15 or so years. Uh, and, uh, but this introduces new challenges. First obvious challenge is that I have significantly increased the dimensionality of my robot. It's no longer just four legs, three motors each. They have, you have a full arm on top, gripper and all this. But the bigger problem is this introduces an obvious local minima in the problem. If your uh, uh, legged robot, if four legs, legs want the top to be stable. Like for them, it's the best when the arm does not move for arm base should be stable. It's best when the arm, when the legs don't move. So they compete against each other. And there are a lot of approaches in the literature which are based on optimization. And if you open their method section, it looks like this. So there are lots and lots of modules, one module for arm and then one module for legs. And then you have to somehow engineer a new optimization to put them together afterwards. And uh, this creates, uh, uh, this requires a lot of effort and uh, may not always get optimal behaviors uh, for you. So the question is, in the spirit of learning for robots, uh, which this conference is about, our question here is, can we design a single policy? Can we learn a single policy to control the whole body of this robot? So before I go into the results or, or the approach, how do we do this? Let me show you some examples here. What do I mean by that? So in all these examples, what we will show, human will only command the end of the arm. And the whole body has to account for this at a very high frequency. So if you Notice this uh, robot here. The human is commanding where the arm should go. And you can notice the legs can bend automatically. The body rolls to the sideways as, as you move arm to the sideways. So arm can reach much farther than it could reach otherwise. So here, human is controlling the arm and defector. So it's the, the shakiness you see is up because of two reasons. Arm is very low cost, and humans are bad at, uh, at this kind of thing. So what we are showing here, so in this example, arm is moving while the legs are walking. So it can, it is stable in those situations as well. So here we tried uh, to test the limits of human ability to control the robot with end defector. So here you pick up something, try to put in a trash and the robot can walk and it can uh, do the whole body control. But again, human is not very precise and arm is not very, uh, uh, so we are showing dirty laundry in the talk itself. <laughs> in the spirit of science. So it can, can put it, it takes time for human to align the uh, the joystick. You're welcome to play with it in the post session yourself. Uh, we'll have live demo here. We got robot all the way from CMU. 
uh, across the world. And uh, here it is uh, wiping whiteboard, etc. Now, if you don't have human, you can also uh, track using vision. This is a demo here. There is no human involved. You just track the AR tag from vision and you can see the arm and legs being controlled together. So how do we do this? Uh, how do we approach this problem? Now, legged like robots are everywhere and the approach that you find, which is common across most methods, contains this two-step magic process. First, train a policy in simulation from some privileged data. Like it can contain anything, uh, like whatever you, it is available. In step two, distill this policy into something via supervised learning that from the information that is coming from onboard sensing so that you can deploy it. To give an example, uh, so one in this, like, for instance, in this case, in phase one, you can train a policy with some privileged information like mass, friction, height, et cetera, and you learn this policy. In the phase two, you distill this policy uh, into a supervised process from history of the robot. So this example is of our previous paper called RMA, but other approaches can also fall into this category. Now, what happens if we just apply this approach to whole body control. So we just take the same method and we apply here on arm and legs. It does not quite work. And when you put this in the real world, sometimes legs work, but notice here there is slight slope. You cannot see in the, in the, in the image very well, but here the robot is trying to go forward and the arm is stretched out and it is not able to move forward because uh, of the weight on, the, on top of it. And there are many more failure examples like this. So it does not work. So what is the issue in this approach? So let's take a step back and look at this uh, figure again. What we are saying here in phase one, we are compressing via RL. In phase two, we are distilling via supervised learning. And we are making an inherent assumption over here. And the assumption is that compression implies predictability. There is no reason if you can compress something very well, you can also predict it very well, right? So this, is, this, is, this supports this issue. And as the dimensionality of the platform increases, there are more, uh, uh, more and more uh, elements in the basis function, so it becomes very difficult to predict. So to fix this, we per perform a very simple, uh, simple trick, and the, and the idea is, why not learn? Why not combine phase one and phase two together, and learn to compress it while simultaneously making sure that your compressed vector is also close to the one coming from the history or or any other data. So you you train the phase one together with phase two. And phase one is trained to perform RL, and while simultaneously it is also it is also trying to make sure that latent is close to the one coming from the history of the robot. So we call this approach regularized online adaptation (ROA). In addition to this, to account for uh, the arm and legs, we also perform this uh, something called advantage mixing. And the idea here is that you want to start with the reward function, which in the beginning tries to help arm and legs separately. But as the training goes on, like this beta goes from zero to one, and as training goes on, the objective for arm and legs becomes shared. So if you say arm should go farther, the only way arm for arm to go farther is to walk over there and then extend the arm. Like if I take my arm to, the, to that corner or something. So this is, the, this is the method. And then we just deploy this policy in the real world as usual from history of the proprioception uh, of the, on the robot. And this is what this leads to all these results. And here uh, are some, again, few more examples of, uh, of the same robot doing uh, doing different tasks with this whole body control. So let's just let us see some results. Uh, so here I'm showing just three uh, methods for now. In paper, there are more details. On top is R method. And you can see there are two metrics. The left one is arm workspace. So this whole body control increases the effective workspace of the arm itself because the body can bend to increase your reach. So imagine yourself trying to pick up some uh, apple or something from the table. You can extend your reach by uh, spreading yourself and spreading your legs. The bottom one separate is like modular approach. The last one is also a shared policy, but the reward is separate for arm and uh, arm and legs. And you can see our method performs best in both the metrics. And this is again updating advantage mixing, and you can see here the blue curve, the advantage mixing helps you obtain lower error in both the scenarios and perform, and is essential for the performance in this setting. So we also can compare to MPC plus IK based methods uh, in, the, in, the, in the paper. In the interest of time, I'll just skip them, uh, and it outperforms them in both uh, easy scenarios as well as hard scenarios. So let's, let us see some dirty laundry. Now, here, dirty laundry is primarily coming from the fact uh, that the hardware is very low cost. So if you see on the left, the motors heat up after 30 minutes. And uh, 
you may have to push the robot to walk forward because its motor doesn't have enough power. So the more you run the robot, the behavior changes. And on the right, since we are doing position control, it's not very good for fine grain tasks uh, in a scenario. So now since we got the robot all the way across the world, so we thought we'll just show you a demo as well in the live. So here, uh, um, the end vector is being controlled. You can see how the legs are bending uh, forward as, as you move the arm to left and right. You can see that these are not the authors of the paper. Uh, these are <laughs> not well practiced to how to use it. Uh, but if you take arm to the left, to the right, it tilts to the right, tilts to the left. And if you if you take it up, if you take it up all the way, you can extend the leg uh, and effectively increase the reach of the arm. Uh, but I can take a question. So this is, uh, thank you. This is the last slide. Thank you very much. Uh, We've got a question up there. Hi, a uh, great presentation. I really liked it. Um, my question was that some tasks require a uh, careful and precise movement of the arm, such as like clicking a button or putting the trash into the garbage can. Uh, but other tasks probably require they're more extensive on like the legs. Uh, how does uh, the advantage mixing kind of uh, account for this? And um, like, what would you do to kind of improve precision? um of the tasks uh, that you can do yeah so this is a very this is a very good question and one thing i did not say in the talk this whole training currently is agnostic to the end task so think of this controller like let's say you buy an arm from franka franka mega panda it already comes with that controller inside it for any task it this controller works so this controller is designed for any task in the end so uh, now we are yet to design a mid-level policy here that can do position control to perform tasks. So we are, the, we are using human in this work. But here, advantage mixing allows us to make sure that for any configuration of arm or the legs, this can reach it if it's possible physically. So uh, for instance, if you say arm should go towards there, the legs can make the robot walk and then take the arm to the corner. So you don't have to worry about any low-level control like you do in, 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 uh, in Franca arm, like it's, it's it's a replacement for that for this legged arm system. Go ahead. So you discussed about how compressing the Z space is not enough, and we need to add this predictability term. I'm wondering if we directly predict the actions mm -hmm. and not the Z, would that fix that problem? So. So the thing is, when you are trying to directly predict the actions, they are, you are trying to solve two problems at once in the beginning. Like you are trying to solve the estimation problem as well as solve the, the control problem. And the control problem, problem here is very hard. So by having this Z vector, uh, we first uh, uh, like separate these two problems into two parts, estimation and control. Then regressing the Z vector, the advantage is give, gives us, like I showed in the dirty laundry, the robot heats up as it walks. So when it heats up, the, the, the CPU gets slow and your system has to be asynchronous at that point. Like you cannot hope that your history is being processed at the exact same rate at all times as you're walking. And this separation of latent allows us to uh, take advantage of that. So it's a completely asynchronous. So history can come at any time. You can use the latest, uh, latest latent and then uh, uh, work from that. There's another question from online. The question is, What's the next step for quadrupeds? So is it training a high level policy at a second arm or something else? <laughs> so this is this is what the motivation of the talk was. So I hope this is the next step of the quadrupeds or beginning of the next step that uh, uh, where you have an arm and then you can put these platforms inside your homes. So this is a very small robot and very safe. You can see uh, as you saw it here. So you feel safe around it. But all the other robots which have arm on top are this big and it's scary. Like you can see a B1 robot over there. I feel scared around it. Uh, so the next step I hope here is that you take such robots, such platform and put in homes and do all sorts of mobile manipulation. Like go up the stairs, take your beer and take up the stairs, not bring the beer on the same floor to the same person. And you can do all sorts of things, but hopefully this is where it goes. Thank you so much, Deepak. I think this session is over.